All right. I think we have your attention now. Um, that uh, well choreographed commercial, you've probably seen it on television or online. Marianne celebrating the uh, 100 years for the NFL. I thought if you guys got a little more gung ho, maybe you'd place some former players in the audience here so we could do like the real, real life version of it. But um, we mentioned uh, Bianca Andreescu right before. Big night for her and big night for the NFL last night as well. Um, this is a special year for the league and there's a lot of preparation, whether it's ads like that one or just behind the scenes can give us a sense on uh, this milestone and, and what you guys have been up to over the last few months getting ready for it. Well, yeah, I mean, this is a massive milestone for the league, 100 years. Uh, first, the prep has been going on for a couple of years, to be honest, and the, this ad, and we can use it as a bit of a case study for how we're thinking about our strategy as we launch into our 100th season. And what you see in that ad is... Um, a, a linking of the past to the future. So an unbridled respect for the tradition and the heroes and the legends of the past of the game, bridging to uh, the newer players. So you saw, um, you know, the, the Tom Brady, that hold my beer kind of moment with yeah, his rings. <laughs> uh, with, you know, it's, it's really important for us to honor the past in a sport like football especially in America where it underpins the culture so much. Some other things that were in that ad that are also important, um, Sarah Thomas was uh, dressed in a black dress. She was said first down. She's the, only, the first and only female official in our league. And then um, at the end of the ad, you saw that young girl in the red dress. Her name is Sam Gordon. She lives in Utah. She started the first tackle football league for girls in her state and has been recognized by the league and around. So... It's really about setting up the future for the league. And you also saw, which we are leaning into more and we can talk about later, and it's relevant to any consumer-facing business today, and that is the use of influencers in marketing. So you saw Juju there, and everyone's like, well, who's Juju? Well, he's like the, one of the best Fortnite players in the world. And if you don't know what Fortnite is, go ask your kids. Um, <laughs> but it was really important to how do you bring, it's the fight for that Gen Z, for that next generation of fans. So music, fashion, all of this kind of stuff is important. When we asked these players to do it, it was literally like just after Christmas and they all want to do it. And we said, just wear what you want. We want to make a statement about how you feel and what you want to wear. So of course you saw Marshawn Lynch in his signature hoodie and things like that. But we really amplified on social before that ad around what they were wearing and why and kind of teased it out. So it's this integration of pop culture, sports and entertainment that is really, I think, going to take um, consumer facing businesses into the next generation. That's helpful insight. And a lot of times we'll generalize a business or generalize the business of the NFL. But, but really what you have is a league uh, that is constantly coordinating and communicating with um, a series of owners. Um, and, and that's probably one of the key reasons why this league was able to, to get to where it is today. Can you just talk about the partnerships uh, that got the NFL to this point in the first place, <laughs> the vision over the years? Right. Well, I mean, it's been a, it's been a long and storied past. Um, and I won't go too far into the history, but more recently, we call it the new competitive era. And I think we have 32 owners, all of whom, um, of course, really want to win. They do, um, when we're in a room all together, and we have about three owners meetings a year, where they do come together and really put the league first, which is super important. And part of the reason for that is the way we share revenue across the league, national media, and regional media rights. And it really provides um, economic and competitive balance so that on any given Sunday, anybody can win. We usually have uh, every year about between seven and nine teams that go from worst to first in their division. So, you know, we like to say we sell hope. And if you think about that, apart from the fact that the New England Patriots seem to keep winning the Super Bowl, um, it it really is a sport where fans can continue to be engaged with their team because the draft is so meaningful and the competitive balance is so fine. So th that's the partnership with the owners, um, but 
there are a lot of partnerships that the NFL is working mm -hmm. on. Probably the one that's gotten the most attention recently is this new initiative with, with Rock Nation. Right. Um, and since we showed that video, probably helpful, it, that is tied in to the Inspire Change um, initiative you guys have. We do have a video from that, which let's show that, and then we can talk a little bit more about what's happening sure. with Rock Nation. The most important thing is our kids and our community. Chicago has been hit with a major spike in gun violence. We kind of tag teamed and said, all right, let's do something. When I heard the stats about literacy by fourth grade being a big marker for success, I was sold. It's really about bridging that gap with the law enforcement. It's about laying a foundation to be able to create change and be able to change lives. Our kids need to see somebody that looked like them, that went through what they went through. So one of the things um, I get asked a lot um, is what has surprised you the most about moving to the States and working at the NFL? And I would say no question, it's the amount of work that these young men and their wives and their families and the coaches and everybody do in their communities and so much of it is under the radar. I mean you saw J.J. Watt last year with the Houston mm -hmm. work that he did, was it last year or the year before, but there's a lot of high profile things. This Inspire Change initiative is really centered around social justice, social injustice, it's around education, it's around police and communities, it's around changing some of these underserved communities so that um, we can really make a difference in the criminal justice system. And it came out of um, a lot of the work that was done with uh, a, a group of players and a group of owners. We for formed a working committee and we're investing heavily in this initiative. And one of the things that ties back to the overall strategy, um, there were a number, over a number of months, um, Roger Goodell was having conversations with Jay-Z, he's the founder of Rock Nation, around how we can make a difference together, how we can bring America together and how we can fix some of the unity issues that the country is currently uh, feeling. And so we entered into this deal, Desiree, who's the COO, and I finished that deal just um, a couple of months ago. And it's really about combining sports and entertainment and artists to activate, inspire change. We are launching an apparel line, we're launching um, an advocate, um, sort of a, an advocate team. So Meek Mill performed last night, and he's poster child for criminal injustice right now in the States, but he performed last night at kickoff, and you will see throughout the season a songs of the season strategy where artists um, craft original songs that are going to be used uh, throughout that month, whether it's in our advertising, in our broadcast, and they will do inspire change events. All those artists will culminate at the Pro Bowl where we'll have a community concert that where all the proceeds for that go to inspire change and just elevating it to a level where together we really start to put a dent in what I have observed to be one of the biggest issues in the country. And technology, with the last panel was talking a lot about technology. I mean, let's face it, uh, any brand is under the microscope all year now. So I guess there was a point when sports felt like they came and went, but that is certainly not the case with, with any big sports league. There's interest uh, probably as much in the off-field activity, who's signing where, just anything uh, for the passionate fans. So is it fair to say that, that you guys are now building the NFL around that, around kind of 12 months as opposed to football season? Right. I mean, I work for Roger, and he's always saying, this is a 12-month sport. You know, the season isn't only 18 weeks. So um, it really is important. And something you said around building stories for the avid fan, we actually turn that on its head a little bit because what we have found is that we can create more engagement from casual fans by telling stories about the players. And how this all sort of comes together is right after the Super Bowl, and about a few weeks after the Super Bowl is the Combine, where young college players get invited to come and they, they do athletics, so that's the 40 yard dash, it's all these sort of drills and things like that and they get measured on that. Well, we started a campaign called Know My Name. And Know My Name, we started celebrating these players who came and, we, and the combine is in Indianapolis and we had 
posters everywhere, lots of graffiti and young art and really fun stuff. And then we would celebrate their combine performances and we would follow them straight through to draft where about 25 prospects usually show up at the draft. And then we told stories about them. And at the combine, we had on social media um, mothers and fathers phoning their sons after they ran the fastest 40 they've ever run. And when they got drafted, we followed that on and we had their mothers write them letters, mothers or fathers or whomever, write them letters. And these young men read them online. And what we found, the feedback on that, not only are you really getting at the emotions of what some of these young men have been through to get to where they are, but the, the unbridled pride that their families and their communities have for them, and the unbelievable thanks to those communities that these men have, which kind of leads to that paying it forward. But this helmets off um, content is really, really important in a world where Everybody wants to know more. Yeah. I want to root for you. Tell me why I should root for you. And it's, it's so important. And then, you know, fewer and fewer fans have, are fans like of a team. They're fans of players. Players move around a lot. So we have to lean into being a fan of a player so that you keep watching and you're engaged, uh, irrespective of what team that guy is playing on. Yeah. And digital has, has opened the door oh, in a big way great. for that. Um, but, I mean, if there was any doubt of, of the business of the NFL, I mean, Barron's do dedicated a lot of space to the business of the NFL recently. And, and while digital is fast growing for you, linear television, I mean, the stats are still mind-boggling to me. I think one of the stats I saw, you can correct me on this, is something like of the, the, the hundred... Uh, most watched programs or most watched live events in a year, like the NFL represents like 60% of that, and if there's no Olympics, it goes up to something like 70%? Right, so in America, we're, last year we were 37 of the top 50 broadcast television shows, and we're number one primetime show for the last, like Sunday Night Football's number one primetime show for the last, I don't know, 10 years running or so. So here's what I'll say, and we had an interesting discussion um, with Washington Post last night when we were talking about the same thing, sort of this structural pressure on a traditional legacy business, which is broadcast television, amid a growing digital um, business. And I would say that we were fortunate, our ratings were buoyant last year, and we um, kind of bucked the trend, as it were, and our ratings rose. But Look, it's it's in a it's in a tidal, you know, tidal going down kind of situation. We know, and I learned that this year uh, when I was head of Bell Media, working with Richard Plepler, who ran HBO. We also know that the digital streaming right now it's only like probably one to two percent of our viewing in the states. Um, a little bit is because we simulcast Thursday Night Football with Amazon Prime and that's behind a paywall. So we have no exclusive games on a streaming platform, which makes a difference. But still, what, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an ecosystem where it's ubiquitous and it's easy for your consumers to find the content. And I keep pushing that at the league because you can slice and dice content and try and get premiums, but at the end of the day, I think over the last decade, what Google and Netflix have taught us is that it's got to be easy and it's got to be ubiquitous. Don't make me work too hard to find your content because, frankly, there's a lot of other good stuff out there to watch. And while live sports, us and the other leagues included, are very important, look, um, Showtime, Amazon, these guys are in our rearview mirror for sure with really good content, and it's on demand so that back to the competitiveness of the game. If a game's a blowout of 20 points or more at halftime, we see audiences tuning out, and you know what? They can just tee up the next episode of Game of Thrones or whatever else it is they're watching. So over to us to create a game and a product that transcends platform and really, really engages audiences at all levels. So, I mean, I know there's still some time before you guys get into the next media rights deals, right. but I'm going to make the assumption these are the kinds of things you have to think about. And I guess we'll watch the evolution of everybody, the, the traditional broadcasters. You mentioned Amazon, who you've worked with, and I saw they just became basically an investor in Yes as well. Mm -hmm. So th they've been gravitating towards some sports. Netflix in the past has has you know, stayed away, shied away from sports, but I guess being able to measure that, whether it's 
TV ratings, how many subscribers come from this content, advertising dollars is all kind of becoming a pie that you're working off or trying to sort of figure out? Very much so. I mean, look, I think one of the, um, we would say our hypothesis is the continued growth and the popularity of the game of football is because for many, many years before I was part of the league, there was real religion around making it accessible to every American. So it has always been on over-the-air television. Now Monday Night Football is on ESPN behind a paywall, and of course Amazon, like I just talked about. But it's about you know accessibility to as many people as possible and reach. So that's one part of the equation. And the other part of the equation is how much really is this younger generation never going to have a cable subscription or a television, television subscription and being where they are? But more importantly than that, is that young generation going to sit down for two and a half, three hours and watch a full football game? And what does that mean for the kind of content and stories that we have to produce? So we do things, we have deals with Facebook, we have deals with YouTubes, where we produce seven minute cut downs of games. So it's not highlights. But if you want to engage in the water cooler conversation or you, you're a fantasy player but you missed your game, you can sort of see all the big games, uh, the, the sort of summary of the games very, very quickly the next day. Also, a product like Red Zone, which I don't know, it's an international audience, so that's a very um, millennial product where it's every single, the Red Zone is the last 10 yards of the field on either end, and it's all the plays at the end, you know, that score basically. So. Things like that, we're just developing products that our viewers want to watch, and those all enter into the soup of the next media deals and what we think about. And, you know, it remains to be seen how it sets up. Is there room for an exclusive streaming um, series? I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know because, you know, I come from telco, so the broadband footprint and the quality of the broadband has to be so strong. And I, I, I caught the tail end of the conversation just before around the power of internet and the importance of broadband. To watch live sport on broadband, it has to be really good. Like the broadband quality has to be good, otherwise it pixelates and you miss things. It's one thing to have it pixelate on a dramatic series because you know it's, you're gonna, it's eventually gonna start up again. But in a, in a live sporting event, it can get a little annoying and frustrating. It is balancing that with technology moving fast. You guys just signed a deal with TikTok. I'm still trying to figure out TikTok, yes. so you gotta move fast. Um, okay, so you just highlighted the fact that uh, you're now the content creator or part of the, the, the content creator, uh, and you were on, on the distribution side before. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would you say, what's been the biggest learning lesson um, for you being on the other side now with the NFL? Well, you know, there's nothing like negotiating with the NFL. <laughs> uh, but what I've learned since I've sat on both sides is that we're both trying to solve the same problem. And so this is very important when you think about the overall strategic objectives of your partners. So if you're trying to drive viewership and consumption and reach, gee, you better be working with partners who want to do that too. And it seems obvious, but you know, Amazon has a lot of other things going on. So whereas CBS and NBC, that's their business, right? So how do you think about that and, and those partners? And then increasingly with our sponsors and people that we partner and, you know, sort of co-brand things with, it's not, just, it's not enough anymore to ask them to write a check so that they can slap their logo up. I mean, how are we blind sharing data so that we can penetrate one another's businesses better? How do we both benefit economically from this? And those are, that gets into the whole cons like customer fan data thing that we're quite advanced on and really excited about. Um, and I think it's a cost of admission in terms of, you know, meeting your fans where they want to be met with the kind of offer that they want to see. Um, and it's just, Partnerships are changing in general. Um, they're less transactional and more relational. They're deeper, and we all want more of one another, and the NFL is no exception. You talked earlier about some of those uh, incredible stories for your players uh, and how they got there. I'm always interested in the stories of business leaders as well. I mean, how does a, a, mm. a civil engineer mm. ultimately make your way to this chief operating officer role at the NFL? Do you ever, do you ever think about that? I don't, um, it's, uh, I don't, you know, it's funny. So 
I didn't even know I was going to be a civil engineer until about a month before I applied. I was actually selling barbecues at Sears Canada to pay my tuition to university. And um, the fellow I worked for at the time said, just go into engineering. You're really good at math and physics. And it was 1984, so not a lot of girls were thinking about that. And um, I decided I would, I would do it. And I, I went into engineering. And he had convinced me that uh, out of engineering, you could do anything. Like, if you really like med, because I, I thought at the time I wanted to be a doctor as every good girl did at that time. Um, and so you could take chemistry, you could go into med medicine, dentistry, MBA. And look, I really liked engineering and worked in it for five years, but decided I wanted more uh, on the business side. So that's when I decided to do my MBA. And after that, um, I, I sort of turned a right angle turn out of engineering into consulting and other things. But then interestingly enough, when I started at Bell, and George asked me to run his operation. While it wasn't civil engineering, it was still engineering. It was um, analytics, it was applied mathematics, it was optimizing truck routes and technicians and workload and service and all of that great stuff and circuit design and broadband help and technical stuff. Uh, and I really, really liked it. And then it was really George that said, we want to broaden you out. So how about going over to Bell Media, where you are now? Yeah. And uh, I said, sure, it sounds like fun, a bit more fancy than uh, the guys in trucks. And uh, I did that and worked with some really great people over there who were patient enough with me to teach me the business, one of whom is your boss, Wendy Freeman. And um, it, was, it was a huge amount of fun. But when the NFL comes calling with an opportunity to work uh, for a platform like that and even though I'm kind of old now, I still think it was really important to, you know, get some international experience, right? Most of my work had been domestic here in Canada, so it was important for me to go to the States and live there and work there and work for a brand that, whew, in a lot of ways, it, it defines small communities and large communities across the country. That was very shocking how penetrated yeah. that sport is in the cultural ecosystem of the country. But you're raising an interesting point. I mean, I know you talk a lot about end zones these days, but I've heard you say getting out of your comfort zone. And it, mm. clearly your career journey tells us that. Like, that's a healthy thing. Right. For you, at least, you, your philosophy on business. Look, um, if, you, if you don't trust people around you and you don't build good teams, you're never going to get out of your comfort zone because it's just too risky. Right? So when I talk to young people today, you know, what's the most important thing you did? I say, well... I always tried to work with great people, but more importantly, and this sounds crazy, but I never mortgaged myself to my job. So I always had freedom to go sideways, to go down, to sort of meander around. Like when I moved to Bell Media, it wasn't a promotion. It was just another opportunity. And I mean, it was media. I knew nothing really about it, right? So I had to learn a lot, but I felt confident because I knew the team was good and I knew that you know, if I, if I flamed out, I flamed out. Well, it would have been fun on the way, right? But you really, um, you have to be comfortable with yourself and with your life outside of work to take on those career risks. Because if you don't, if you aren't comfortable, then, um, you know, you aren't going to make those risky decisions in business or for your own career. All right, we're almost out of time. Um... I heard, I read this, you can, you can set the record straight. Uh -oh. Passing versus rushing. Passing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I like it. The fans love it. Look, a rushing game is great. Um, just ask Seattle. But, uh, you know, it, it, passing is fantastic. It's done a lot of what brought the excitement back to the game last year in terms of our best quarterbacks standing up, healthy, throwing the ball like crazy. So uh, to wrap things up uh, on, on that note, is Tom Brady human? Yes. I saw those rings. He is. You can confirm it. Confirm. Yes, he's here. a very good human. Um, Marian, thanks very much. It's been a great conversation. Um, it'd be great if we could just, as we, there, you have a final video you're going to show us as we right. as we so make our was, exit. Just to explain. This was entry into this season, and are you ready? Here we go.